We continue in Isaiah this morning. Uh, we conclude, however, this small sub-series we've been doing on biblical justice. And in case you missed the previous messages, Jared Mellinger opened up two weeks ago, and then Jared Torrance preached Isaiah 58 uh, last week. So we close that series, that sub-series today with Isaiah 59. The title of the message for you note-takers is Why Justice is so elusive. I want to get started with a story. About 15 years ago, Gina discovered right underneath her wedding band a little rash on her skin. We were hoping that did not mean she was allergic to marriage. <laughs> so we went to a doctor, and uh, the dermatologist did his examination, and at the end of that, Gina asked what is a reasonable question. Where did it come from, and how do I prevent it from happening again? Here's his answer. It came from water accumulating under your ring. In the future, wash your hands like this. <laughs> this is important. You seeing this? You're picking up maybe some of the problems I had with this council. <laughs> First, we had been married for 10 years. She had previously washed her hands, no rash. Secondly, what is up with this? <laughs> this solves one problem and creates 20 more. We had two or three kids at the time, most of them in diapers. I don't need to keep that story going. You follow me, right? Major problems. Now, this poor, well-intended doctor could not identify the real cause of the problem. But his solution was worse than the problem. And had Gina been foolish enough to follow it, she would have been a breeding ground for germs. And I'm telling you this story for this reason. One of the problems with justice issues is that we're often not much better than the doctor. We either don't know or don't understand the diagnosis. And therefore, our prescriptions, our fixes, can often create more problems. As the church, I want to ask us this morning to aim higher than that. Let's seek more when it comes to understanding justice and injustice. We want to be those who administer good counsel and effective medicine to this issue. Folks, Christians ought to be those who approach justice in a way that avoids the hollow hopes the world offers us and clings to Christ for its hope. And so let's begin this journey this morning by reading all of Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs. They weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies. And from one that is crushed, a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. 
Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know. And there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us. And righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then, then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repaying to his em- repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, This is my covenant with them, declares the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. Let's pray. Oh, Father, would you take these inspired, authoritative words and in the moments that follow, would you fill me with your spirit, fill your people with your spirit, that your word would be accomplished and that this message, that these words would not return void, but would bear the fruit that they've been sent to bear. Do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So I said we want to be good physicians that administer good counsel and good medicine. So our three points are built around that goal. First, the diagnosis. A call to humility. In the diagnosis here, folks, we have the crux of the problem. We see the problem in mankind's proposals for justice. It's the overarching cause of why justice is elusive. You see, far too frequently, and much more than we're comfortable admitting, we don't identify the problem correctly. 
the world's diagnosis is either missing, they don't even see the problem, or they try to address the problem and they do it incorrectly. At best, what the world can bring is the ingenious hand-washing counsel of 2005. If they even fix the problem, the prescription creates two more, four more, six more. At the crux of how humanity approaches injustice, we want to believe that we are good. We want to believe that our motives are essentially pure and we just need to fix the minor flaws in our nature or in our methods. Folks, if our starting place for addressing injustice is our own goodness, we are always going to end up with the wrong conclusion. Mankind's methods require mankind's goodness which leaves mankind's plans vulnerable to error, vulnerable to ignorance, and vulnerable to arrogance. Here's the truth. Mankind was created to be good. With the image of God imprinted upon every man, every woman, every child. But the fall corrupted that goodness. And Isaiah 59 is still answering questions from Isaiah 58. Here's the questions it's still answering. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? The focus of those questions in Isaiah 58 is essentially this. Why have our efforts not worked? They consider their efforts essentially well-intended... And as a result, they question God's goodness. We keep trying. We keep doing. Why is God failing us? Why is he not noticing? So at the beginning of Isaiah 59, God turns this whole thing on its head. It's not mankind's goodness and God's questionability. It's God's goodness and man's questionability. Look at verse 1. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. God is saying, listen, the problem is not with me. The problem is not with God. And then verses 2 through 8 go on in this graphic technicolor to show us why mankind cannot generate justice. Verse 3. Our hands are defiled with blood. Verse 4, we rely on empty pleas and we speak lies. Verse 7, we run to evil and we're swift to hurt others. And that's just a sampling of what Isaiah lays out for us in this mirror that he holds up to us in Isaiah 59. Every great stride mankind takes toward justice is corrupted by the willfulness of mankind's sin and our propensity to ruin and to defile true justice. And we make mistakes in two ways. We play God by crafting justice after our own desires and our own image. And then we worship the things we create, worshiping idolatrously, the creation above the creator. Andy Crouch has a fantastic book called Playing God. I recommend it. In that, he says this. God hates injustice and idolatry because they are the same thing. Whether making false gods, which is idolatry, or playing false gods, which is injustice, the result is identical. The true image of God is lost, and not just lost, but replaced by something that purports, often very persuasively, to represent the ultimate truth about reality. So we replace God with idols, and we replace God with ourselves, and we wonder why our efforts don't work. Of all the people on earth, 
Brothers and sisters, the born-again Christian should have the greatest capacity for mercy, the greatest passion for justice, and the greatest discernment to determine what will get us there. But too frequently, followers of God have their social and their political thinking handed to them by one party or the other, by one politician or another. Because that platform or that person persuasively purports to represent the real solution. We're in a season where the presidential election is starting to stir. And so we hear these errors from popular pulpits. We read them in best-selling books. We see it with relationships the church has with particular parties and politicians, candidates, nonprofits, lobby groups. We're confronted with the church being affected by this in our social media feeds as we watch one professing Christian after another professing Christian fall victim to the wrong diagnosis, leading them to place their confidence in the hollow hopes of successful elections and political heroes. And as we see, if you look at verse 10, these blindnesses that we adopt often invite in. They leave us groping the walls like blind men and stumbling in daylight as though it's pitch black. Blindly, we, we, here's what we do, folks. Let's just be honest. We amplify the weaknesses of our opponents in politics, in social policy, while muting the weaknesses of those who represent our preferences. The biggest problem we face is not the difference between red state and blue state. The biggest problem is not the difference between left or right, between liberal and conservative. Isaiah 59 holds out in undeniable truth the biggest problem we have is the difference between us and God. That's what we face, and that's what the world's trying to fill the difference between us and God. They don't know it, but that's what they're trying to fill. We see it right in verses 1 and 2, where God says the problem is not with me. The problem is your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And then look at verses 12 and 13. Isaiah, in this first person plural, includes himself and summarizes this. He says, for our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. And listen to this grocery list. Transgressing, denying the Lord, turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. Isaiah 59 was written a long time ago, folks, but it is for us. We must be careful not to remove ourselves from its correction or we will inevitably find ourselves falling into the errors it's rebuking us for. As the church, as those filled with Christ, as those with the inspired word of God in our hands, we must rightly diagnose injustice. We've got to see in humility what mankind is and the best mankind can produce. So if that's, if that's the problem, mankind's fallenness, mankind's sin, what's the prescription? How do we achieve justice if everything we offer when pursuing it is corrupted? Well, that's point number two, the prescription. We have the diagnosis, a call to humility. Prescription, a call to gospel hope. Now, before we break that open, I want to hit a couple of the places we are prone to place our hope. I want to hit them specifically and try to show them for what they are. The first is this, money. 
there are injustices in in our society that would benefit from more investment, no doubt. But do you know what inevitably follows money in government? What follows money? Corruption, inefficiencies, and bureaucracy. More money may be needed, but money isn't big enough to hold our hopes and do them justice. Second is education. Folks, information has never been more available in history than it is today. College degrees abound. Everybody has almost all the knowledge of the world available right through your search engine. Are we more just as a result? In some areas, maybe. In other areas, we're less just than we were. Eliminating ignorance, and let me say this, particularly willful ignorance, is important. But it clearly hasn't delivered us to justice. It's not big enough to do the job. And then third, I've already alluded to this in some things I've said, but I want to name it, politics. In my lifetime, nine different people have been president of the United States. There have been Republicans and Democrats. We can now, glory to God, say that there have been black and white. And one day, we will likely be able to say there have been men and women. But let me ask you this. Under which of these nine administrations did we achieve justice? Come on, let's be honest. None of them. Were there administrations that did better on justice than others? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Doesn't that entirely depend on which justice issue we're looking at? Doesn't it depend on the justice issues that matter most to you? Nixon, I'm going to go through them, you ready? Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan... H.W. Bush, Clinton, W. Bush, Obama, and Trump. Which of these has been the answer to the problem? Come on, friends, none of them. None of them. If Trump wins this next election, he won't be the answer we need. And if one of these 20 people that debated this, this week win the presidency, they won't do the job either. Verse 14, take a look at it. It says, justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. And then we get to see God's response to that in the middle of verse 15 going into 16. Look at it, right the middle of 15. The Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. Listen to this next next sentence. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. He didn't suddenly see one of these nine presidents and say, oh, there he is. There is no one to fix this problem. And so what does God do? He sends someone. He sends someone. Start looking at verse 16 with me through verse 20. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay justly wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And then this next wonderful sentence. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. God looked and there was no one. He says, I've got just the man for the job. And he sends his son. 
and his son comes and he puts on righteousness and he wears salvation and he executes justice and he elevates the lowly and we got to see all of this in his earthly ministry. He rebuked the religious elite. He gave no deference to the politically elite. He didn't lead a single governmental uprising. He never ran for office. He loved sinners. He leveled gender inequity. He gave no room for racism. And folks, all of that is before the cross. It's all before his victory on the cross he did all of those things. After the resurrection, he sends his spirit to us so that we can continue doing the very same things. So that we can hold out Christ as the solution. And we can leave no room for racism. And we can lever gen level gender inequities. And we can raise up the poor. And we can raise up the lowly. And we can use our high position to bless and serve others. We are just being called to do what he did. How does the world respond to this incredible solution? The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. The world doesn't want God's solution because they'd have to think less of themselves. We'd have to acknowledge we're not enough to get the job done. For justice to be done, do we need more education? Do we need more money? Do we need the right man or woman in office? Now, let's be honest, these things are not inconsequential. They help, right? I'm not throwing them out. But they have their place, and their place is not our hope for justice. There will be no true justice apart from Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. So, if the proper diagnosis is our humility, seeing mankind for what we are, and the proper prescription is that every thought, word, and deed would be rooted in hope in Jesus Christ, we need finally to look at the prognosis. How do we engage justice in our world to the glory of God? And so point three, the prognosis, a call to action. Folks, listen. God has not left us here so that we can become smarter. He has not left us here so that we can simply be an example. He has left us here to engage the injustice around us, to take the gospel with us to that injustice, and to right the wrongs, to level the field, and to go with Christ following in his footsteps. Tim Keller says this wonderfully. If a person has grasped the meaning of God's grace in his heart, he will do justice. If he doesn't live justly, then he may say with his lips that he is grateful for God's grace, but in his heart, he is far from him. Grace should make you just. Have you received grace from God? Surely more than one person has received grace. Have you received grace from God? Earlier in this service, your hands were lifted out of gratitude for grace. That's right. It should be. Let's take those hands and let's apply them to some injustice, shall we? Let me give you some areas, ways to do this. First, promote the gospel. Verses 16 to 20, as we've already examined, declare with boldness, Christ is the only answer the world needs for every injustice. Yes. Guess what? We have Christ. We know Christ, 
and others need Christ. Evangelism is not a cheap church growth plan. It's not just a way to keep people from going to hell. Gospel evangelism promotes biblical justice. If you care about biblical justice, folks, share the gospel so that the lost world around us can know Christ and be filled with the spirit we have and have their worldview changed so they treat others in a Christ-like way, so they spend their, their finances in Christ-like ways, and so they vote in keeping with biblical justice. Share the gospel with the lost and dying world around you. It deals a death blow to injustice because now people live with the same conviction and power that we do. But it's more than just sharing. We also must live the message of the gospel. Few people are going to care about your calls for justice if your life contradicts it. So live a just life. And as we promote the gospel with our words, and as we demonstrate the gospel with our lives, the strongholds of injustice will weaken in front of us. How does Christ put it? The gates of hell will not prevail. Amen. Second, suffer for truth. I want to be honest with you. This is a very honest point here. If you promote the gospel, this world will oppose you. Yes. Take a look at verse 15, the beginning of verse 15. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Do you understand that verse? We're supposed to depart from evil, right? You just signed up to be prey for the rest of your lives. Because this world doesn't want to tolerate justice, righteousness. They don't want it. If you live for it, they will oppose you. Standing for truth will make you seem like a fanatic. At times, according to the world's standard, you will be a bigot. You will be closed-minded, unenlightened under evolved and this tolerance promoting culture simply will not tolerate righteousness and truth so when the world turns against you it's not a sign you're doing something wrong according to verse 15 we should fully expect this to happen more and more but I want to make an exception here. And I want you to listen carefully, particularly those of you who are very active on the internet and social media. If you've discovered that sometimes standing for what you believe to be true does garner pushback from your wise and godly friends, you may be doing something wrong not standing for truth, it's almost always your manner in doing it. When we stand for what's true, we're still called to be Christ-like. We're still called to be godly. What does that mean? It means we're still called to be kind, to be charitable, to be humble, to be meek. Amen. The call to suffer for truth is not a get-out-of-jail-free card to be rude. You just sound and look like the world. And it won't make a bit of difference. The demand for godliness is higher for those who will stand for truth in a day like ours. So if this struggle is, is real for you to be godly when standing for truth, I recommend 1 Peter 2.20 as a memory verse. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Now, if you're going to suffer for truth, 
I don't want to leave you hanging. I want to be specific. In our year, in our culture, what might it look like? Let me ask you these questions. Ought a person's worth be determined by their financial status? Well, the answer is no. And so therefore, the Christian ought not stand for it. Join the call of generosity to help those in need. Don't affirm policies that further victimize the poor, regardless of what politician supports them. If you're a person of means, use the abundance God has given to you to lift up those who have been given less. Church, we've got to think more deeply about these things. Don't just look at specific bad decisions an individual may have made. Be wise enough to look behind it to consider why. Perhaps a family of origin, perhaps the effects of public policy, perhaps their culture set them up for struggling. And so avoid your arrogance and your prejudice and your neglect and help and vote and advocate for justice in these things. That may take stepping beyond your immediate circle and getting messy in the lives of others. So ought a person's worth be determined by their ethnicity? No. I'm going to ask you two more questions. They're both no, just in case somebody messes that up. <laughs> a Christian ought not stand for it. Pursue relationships with those who are different from you, whose race and culture differ from yours. Seek to learn from them. But do more than just this interpersonal work. Folks, let's be smart. Look at public policies that either intentionally or unintentionally result in a disproportionate impact on one race or on one ethnicity. Listen, pray and work and vote and care deeply about prison reform. Care about the laws that have created a racial imbalance and care about the treatment of those so that what we're doing is just and not simply creating a different injustice. Learn about the systemic governmental decisions that decimate the inner city. Don't tolerate, listen please, don't tolerate conversation or entertain opinion that allows authorities to target one race over another. When, when you ask your questions, you may not immediately agree with what they're saying. Their understanding of, of an event may be different from yours. But don't dismiss their answers. Listen. Learn. Care. Pray. And then take action to right injustice. Ought a person's worth be determined by gender? No. Guys, the Christian ought not stand for this. Check your own life, men, to see if you wrongly judge or objectify women. Next time you're in a group of guys and one of them or all of them start talking about whether this woman or that woman is attractive or unattractive, don't smile awkwardly and remain silent. That is tacit agreement. Be willing to suffer for truth and speak up for her. When you speak up for her, all the guys around you will wonder what your problem is. Tell them, my problem is you're wrong. She's made in the image of God and somebody's got to stand up for that. Ladies, next time you're in a group of ladies and men start getting trashed, stand up for them. Guys, declare that sexual harassment in our culture is unacceptable. Don't tolerate it. And don't lump it into some caricature of a liberal political agenda. It's unjust and it ought not be. Take these perspectives to the voting booth. Men and women were made to be equal. Stand for them to be equal. It's not liberal or conservative. It's just right. Lastly, ought a person's worth be determined by their stage of life? 
so the Christian ought not stand for it. The image of God imprinted upon a person must be defended in the very first stage of life. Disagreement with that is disagreement with God. I don't care what party you belong to. Disagreement with protecting the unborn is disagreement with God. So stand up for the rights of the preborn and bring your armor. Don't tolerate an argument that justifies abortion. Stand for truth. Insist that this injustice stop. But go beyond this to demand the respect of the image of God on those in all stages of life, including their final stage. Advocate for just treatment of nursing home patients and the need to care well for them. Embrace the sacrifice of caring for elderly parents as their strength fades. Visit the elderly and love them. We've told you over and over again, this pulpit will never be used for politics. I'm not talking politics. I'm talking justice. And these issues matter. Matthew Henry holds out a call of justice for us. He says, when justice is not done, there is blame to be laid, not only upon the magistrates that should administer justice, but upon the people that should call for it. Well, folks, let's call for it. Now, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware that you are unlikely to be able to support all of these areas with one vote or one candidate. Prison reform is often an issue of the Democratic Party. Pro-life is often an issue of the Republican Party. Biblical justice cannot be satisfied simply by blindly voting party lines. Don't be disheartened by that. Christianity ought not be limited to a party's platform. As Christians, we've got to be free before God to support justice initiatives, whether they come from our less preferred party or our more preferred party. We belong to God, not those parties. We vote with God, not with those parties. And we invest ourselves there and not here. I know it's complicated, but we've got to be thinkers. We've got to be readers and askers and learners. But more than anything, church, if we're going to promote biblical justice in these areas, we must be prayers. We need to promote the gospel. We need to suffer for truth. But we must pray. If you've taken in everything I've said so far, it's likely you feel like it's too much. There are too many conflicting issues, too many things to care about. We just can't do it all. I read the passage a long time ago. Maybe you have forgotten verse 21. Look at it, please. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. God looked down upon us, and he agrees with you. It's too big for you. There was no man, no woman to write these things, no one to facilitate and realize justice, but he sent the Redeemer. And then he gave us the same spirit the Redeemer had to carry out the justice the Redeemer did. The power of the Spirit, we're told in verse 21, will fill our mouths with words. It will be passed on to the next generation so that they can be a generation of justice. He fills us with wisdom and insight. He empowers us to fight for justice without losing our Christian testimony. We have power to be winsome and kind even as we oppose injustice and fight for justice. 
We have the power of the Spirit of God for our patience and for long suffering as we address problems that are tens, twenties, even hundreds of years old. And it's the same Spirit who hears our unutterable groans for justice. And that Spirit intercedes for us. So Covenant Fellowship Church, let's be a church that prays about these things. I'm going to give you three things to pray about and then close. Pray for justice. If you don't now possess the answer to prison reform or economic relief, you can certainly pray for it. You can pray about it. Be sure that justice finds its way into your prayer life as a discipline. And pray for those who are on the front lines of each of these things. We have ministries here. Pray for the ministries that are serving in these justice areas. And pray for those who are politically on the front lines of these things, even if they are a different political party than you prefer. Pray for them. Second, pray for revival. We need an outpouring of the Spirit on this land. But let's be honest. It's not American-centric. We need an outpouring of the Spirit on every land. So pray for it. But pray for those genuinely professing the name of Christ. Worldwide revival would be incredible. That would be great. But we truly need the church to stand up and be the church. In his commentary, John Oswalt says, one of the facts of history is that when revival comes to a people, it never starts among those furthest from God. Typically, it starts among those closest to him. So pray for revival right here at Covenant Fellowship Church. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Pray for gospel preaching churches in this part of the state, in this area. Pray for those churches. Pray for sovereign grace churches throughout the world. Pray that the Spirit would help us promote the gospel, suffer for truth, and pray as we ought. But lastly, church, and this is personal, pray for conviction. Most of the injustices a professing Christian commits, that person is blind to. You don't know it because it's in your blind spot. The Lord does, and the Lord can open your eyes. So ask him to convict you of known sin, of hidden sin. Ask him to convict you of indifference you may have to one of these areas I've mentioned and the many, many more I could have mentioned. Pray that you personally would have the mind and the heart of Christ. Pray that you would love the things that God loves, that you would hate the things that God hates, and that you would have the discernment to know the difference. Start with your own heart and mind. Work in your family to cultivate, to cultivate a heart of biblical justice. If you've fostered a single-party view or too narrow a perspective in your home, confess that and fight for more biblical balance in your understanding of justice. Listen, these things matter. But what will happen if we dare to turn our attention to these things? I'm going to project Isaiah 58, 14 that Jared covered last week. When we care about these things, listen, this is what God says. Then you shall take delight in the Lord. And I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of of the Lord has spoken. We're never going to realize complete justice until Christ comes back. When he does, there will be no more sin, no more death, no more oppression, racism, sexism. They're all gone. Let's be people now who live for that kingdom and not this one. It's going to make us strange in this world, and they won't like it. But the more you do it, the more it will cause you to long for that one. My, My prayer as I prayed for this is that this church 
the gospel preaching church worldwide would be the body that truly lives out justice for all. Can we ask God to help us do that, church? Amen.